Union Street, Wickham, is once again a fairly quiet back lane after last night's ordeal at number 15 when about 60 police, some of them armed, and scores of pressmen and bystanders were clustered around the house. At about 5.30, a girl was heard to yell out, that's the man, when she saw him in this area. Someone then called the police. Hearing the alarm had been raised, he came into the house on the pretext of wanting to make a phone call. He then grabbed a Mrs. Shepherd, who lived here with her mother, Mrs. Joyce Avery, and daughter Kim, who ran out into the street and called two men to come and help. When the men went into the house, the man released Mrs. Shepherd, but took Mrs. Avery hostage in the back of the house, threatening her with a knife. Well, we had to talk to the man. He made certain requests which we acceded to. We got two of his friends here and he told us that he would uh, surrender the woman out in 10 minutes and uh, he kept uh, holding us up and holding us up until such times as we had to go in. How did you go in? I wasn't first in, one of the other boys was first in, had to force the door and push the washing machine aside. Was there any, uh, was she in any danger at all? I mean, did he threaten to kill her? No, he made no threats to the woman. We were in constant touch to see that she was all right. And uh, each time we spoke to her, she said she was all right. 
but it'd be very embarrassing being held hostage for that length of time. How did she handle it? that not many women could go that long without becoming hysterical and panic-stricken at some time during it. And uh, never once did she, uh, she, she lose a cool. And she, uh, the last time I heard her speaking was about one o'clock and then she must have went to sleep from exhaustion or something. You didn't know about the, the siege until you heard the radio news about 11 o'clock. Now, now unfortunately, I did hear and know yeah. about it. I heard it at the six o'clock news, but all I said was in Wickham. I see. And then I yeah. went into the kitchen and switched the television off at... Uh, Mm. Uh, at, uh, at about a quarter to eleven, then switched the radio on in the kitchen, mm. and when the news came over, mm. it uh, it said that there was uh, the, the siege was being conducted in a house in Union Street. Well, I said, goodness me, there's not many houses in Union Street, it's my street. Mm. And I immediately then opened the door and came out and was tripped over something the police had there, mm. and I didn't even know that the police was all around the place. Yeah. Me mates, uh, told me that uh, someone was out there drowning. Yeah. And uh, did you ever did you see anything in the water? No. And I came up here on the hill with all my mates, and uh, we had a look out there, and I could I could see his hands, like above the water. Was he waving for help? Yeah. He? And so um, I went down and picked up my mates' uh, board and wetsuit and that, and tried to get out. I went out about 10 yards, and you can't get out there. The rip's too strong. Well, I was tearing me to shreds. How long was it before the, the fellow disappeared? Well, it was about, uh, well, about 15 minutes. And he hasn't been seen since? Nah. Yeah, you there you go. Yeah, young. Yeah. Come on, get your rise now. I'm going to slide you through. The boys will take you. Right in there. 
At about 1.30 this morning, 11-year-old Howard Tetron was woken by the sound of his mother screaming for help. He found her lying in the hallway with several fatal stab wounds to her body. Police arrived soon after, and the dying Mrs Tetron only managed to speak six words, which police aren't releasing, before she passed away. Police believe the assailant was only robbing the house, but in his course through the kitchen to the bedroom, he'd picked up a knife to protect himself. That knife was used on Mrs Tetron in the bedroom and in a struggle throughout the hall. Police point of view, I was very, uh, uh, very happy about the exercise. It was an exercise that was not only concer concerned with a land exercise, but also incorporated a water exercise. And uh, this required more personnel uh, from all the services. Uh, but uh, so far as uh, the police uh, side of things uh, went, I was very pleased. In fact, it was considered uh, during the. Uh, initial drafts of the exercise and then and in the planning stage that it be a three hour exercise. We finished the exercise at 11.51 uh, which was slightly inside the three hours and uh, I think from this point of view uh, we achieved something on just what we can do as so far as time factor is concerned. I'd also like to mention that uh, I was uh, very pleased with the cooperation given to us by the other service, services, namely the, uh, the ambulance and the fire brigade. They all worked together well, didn't they? They all worked, uh, to my knowledge, very well. As uh, being uh, with a command structure and a control centre, most things uh, in, uh, at that level uh, come through that centre and uh, one can appreciate just how well they do their job together. What's the main danger? Well, the seriousness of it is it chases water, to be quite honest, to, to put it in a simplified form. Mouths, ears, eyes, or anything of this nature, it will attack it. Um, it will not burn, will it? It will burn, serious burn, either skin or respiratory and this type of thing, and it can be very serious as far as the individual is concerned. Other than that, there's not a great deal to worry, but that is our main source of problem. So you're going to have to use breathing apparatus to move in close yeah. to it? Anywhere at all that uh, you've got this type of thing, I'm talking about the eyes, whether it's, you've got the watering on the mouth, and that has to be completely sealed off from the... The situation, so all that equipment will be used. So the job will be to try and uh, what, plug the leak and then unload the rest of it. No, no, all of that stuff will have to be offloaded into other tanks before they can turn it over. It, it, uh, it'll have to be drained and refilled onto other areas. We've got a truck coming in now.
We've got another tanker on the way at the moment, and uh, yeah, we're just transferring the What's about 11 tonnes, is there? About 11 tonnes. We're on the upwind side of the tanker, but people almost a kilometre away can smell the fume, so it's fortunate that the accident happened out here in the countryside and not in a town. Fortunately, the story had a satisfactory ending. Satisfactory in as much as a life was saved. But perhaps this rather sad little occurrence shows just how those who find it hard to cope with the pressures of society can be upset by a seemingly simple incident of the dog being taken away. For the second time today, firemen in this area have had to close. <coughs> For the second time today, firemen in the Nelson's Bay area have had to close a major road. Firstly, Nelson's Bay and now Soldiers Point Road. <laughs> this area is getting intolerable. The cars have been blocked off. Firemen are fighting blindly. There's no idea what's going on. The flames are starting to jump the road now, and there's spot fires starting towards the Taylor's Beach area. Mr. Frockner, your house is pretty well uh, in danger here from the fire. What can you do about it? Just watch it. Well, it's going to burn. It's going to burn your house. That's why I have the tractor started. So in case something happens, I can hold hose it down. I see your wife and children left. They left, yeah. I told them to go. What about your possessions? What are you going to do about them? It's insured. It's insured. A lot is insured. Doesn't help much, though, does it? No, but no, I can't help it. Okay. It's still better I have my life than... Well, you're going to stay here till it burns. Oh, I stay here. Here at the access road to Taylor's Beach, firemen are trying to stop it from jumping. If it does, there's houses about a kilometre that way, and they're going to be in a lot of trouble. They're going to have to be evacuated out this road. If this doesn't work, there's going to be a hell of a trouble here. This is what it looks like from the access road to Taylor's Beach. This is what the firemen are trying to stop from jumping the road. You can see those flames are impossible to stop. We're right in the middle of it. I don't know how the firemen feel, but we're pretty scared. Minutes later it happened. The fires jumped the road and it's heading towards Taylor's Beach. They're going to have to fight through bush to get to this. There's flame and ashes jumping the road here now.
The residents here in Station Street were safe up until about half an hour ago. A sudden change of wind has brought all this right across them. Some of them are lucky. Some of them have got brick houses, but some of them haven't. They're busily hosing down their houses, but they haven't got much chance if this fire jumps the road. The firemen are here, but they haven't got much hope either. How long have you been expecting this? Oh, not for long, about uh, half an hour, just the wind change, just to push it out. You were out of the way there for a while, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, we was. You going to stay here? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's not dangerous yet. Not dangerous? No, no, it won't come out through the road. I don't think so. Yes, the, uh, the situation at the present time in the Anna Bay, Fingal Bay, Nelson Bay area is uh, not very bright at all. The fire is spotting at least half a mile ahead of us all the time, and each spot it gives us another front to work on. So uh, uh, at this stage we've got uh, the, the Army, the uh, RAF uh, coming in with fire units, the ambulance service are sending units in, and uh, it's a matter at this stage playing it by ear. The police squad, rescue squad's coming in, all of the available police are in the area working, and uh, it's just a devoted effort of all uh, services at this stage, uh, fighting to uh, save what we can. You say that he is conscious, Peter, and he has feeling in toes, arms, and legs. Is that the position? Yeah, that's the position. He's conscious. Uh, he knows what he's about. He's okay that way, but he, he has a lot of pain in the lower back area. Right. Stretcher. We want you to put Gary on the stretcher before you move him away from the rock fall. Right, that's what we plan to do.
So you're getting a build-up of pressure within the inner cylinder. That's right, because of loss of this vacuum on the outer tank. Are you worried that that pressure could reach a critical point? No, there's no, there's no danger whatsoever. There is a valve. The first safety valve is set at 280, and it will go off and release any excess pressure. We doubt, though, that it will even reach that stage. You've just got to wait for advice before you move it. At this stage, we're waiting for advice from the company who own the vehicle as to whether or not they want to pump it out before it's shifted.
Garth, can you tell us what uh, you saw when you arrived on the scene in Nevada Town Road? Oh, when I got there, the fire was right down the end of the, um, the grandfather's property. And there was really no concern for worry, you know, because it wasn't there. So I went down, right down the bottom to have a look. And all of a sudden, the flames, the wind caught it. And I was running, virtually running, because the flames were going that fast. I, I never knew how fast the flames could go that fast. It was a firestorm? Yeah, yeah. So what happened when you got back to the house? Were your grandparents in trouble? Yeah, they were, they were on the back of the house. And I heard my auntie say, yell, oh, the house is going. So I, me, I tried to save my car, but it was no use. I started it, and I s saw the flames were coming up really quick. So I, I knew if I didn't get out, the car would probably explode on me. So I, I just ran. And as I jumped out of the car, I, wa I didn't get engulfed in flames. I just got engulfed in heat sheer heat from the flames. The flames were, say, 10, 20 yards away from me, but the heat just did that. And how did you get to hospital? Oh, well, I, I ran, sort of, I was in a craze, really. I ran through the bush at the back of my grandfather's place, and um, <coughs> some, an old guy, I forget his second name, Snowy, he said his nickname was, uh, kindly took me to hospital. He going through red lights and everything. He didn't waste any time? No, no, he was really good. Right, you're welcome. Right, you're welcome. Anyone else? Did someone <laughs> Oh, wait, what's sugar? <laughs>
that's right. I'd, I moved it from one side of the road to stop a tree from virtually burning down to the other side of the road where it was sort of more safer. Why did you do that, risk your life? Well, everyone else was virtually just standing around watching it, so I thought, well, someone's got to do something about it. So if the doors are shut, nobody will want to come in here. Yeah. We're trying to keep as many people away as possible in case okay. they bottle this size. Yeah. And if you're going to work here... I was just cleaning up around the uh, around the site there, Tim, and amongst a lot of bracken fern, we cleaned up in there, and I thought it was a beer bottle. Went to move it out the road, nearly stuffed me toe on it, didn't move, and uh, we just pushed it one side and had a look and cleaned the dirt off it, and here it is, an army shell. What did you do then? I well, we just rolled it to one side, and I went and got in the two-way and rang our office up and told them what I'd found, and they said they'd get in contact with the appropriate authorities. I suppose you got well out of the way then? Oh, yes, yes, just moved away. Well, would you put a little addition on that message I gave you previously, please? Informing, please, that the device before being disarmed would have to be removed. The area is too densely populated. That questioning has been going on for several hours now and is expected to go on for a couple of hours more. It's not expected to be tonight before a man is formally charged and he's expected to appear in Maitland Court first thing in the morning. It was an obviously shaken and very sombre Detective Inspector Norm Shiva who came out of the police station to speak to waiting newsmen. A 31-year-old man from uh, Tommy Gale has been taken into custody and is presently being questioned and he will uh, subsequently be charged with the murder of this sergeant and uh, superintend the murder of the constable. Do you allege that this was a premeditated act? No, we don't allege that at all. Well, in what circumstances did the shooting take place? After the sergeant spoke to uh, the offender in relation to his possession of a number of pistols, uh, he then advised the offender he was going to take possession of the firearms and it was then the shooting took place. It's a very serious blow and it's a, a very sad day for all of us, really. Could it have been avoided? I don't think so, no. It could not have been avoided. 